Welcome everyone, can everyone hear me? I'm Ralph Michaels, as most of you know, I'm currently director of the Center of International and Comparative Law. Um, the most important thing in introducing events is of course to invite you to come to the next event. The next event the center runs is very, very soon. It's in uh, four hours and 15 minutes. And that is the Global Law Workshop at 4.30, at which Anna Galpin will be in room 4042 and tell us about the international implications of the uh, mortgage crisis. And for those of you who have heard about the existence of such a mortgage crisis and its international implications, it might be helpful to see where it leads to and how it should be resolved. That's at 4.30, that's in room uh, 4042. What we have now, of course, is um, a really great presentation by uh, Laura that Scott will introduce, so I will introduce Scott and he will introduce her. And this fits quite well because um, Scott Silliman, who most of you know, um, is really an expert on many of the things that um, Laura Dickinson will speak about. You know Scott Silliman as a professor of the practice here, of course, where he's been since, uh, I think, 1993. He's director of the um, LENS, Center for uh, Law, Ethics, and National Security. But before that, he was um, an attorney in the Air Force for 25 years, starting in 1968, right after law school. So has huge experience of um, legal things within the military. And of course, what Laura will talk about is how many of the things that the military, among other institutions, used to be in charge of are now being privatized, externalized out of the military into the hands of private contractors. So we'll see how that relates. But with that, that's Scott's job. I will not do this job. So Scott, please, thank you. Thank you, Ralph. I think uh, most everyone knows that over the last decade, there has been an explosion in what we call privatization or outsourcing of governmental functions to private contractors. As a matter of fact, you, you probably have read in the papers that if you look at Iraq right now, uh, there are 180,000 private contractors in that country, far more than we have uniformed troops. Uh, private contractors have been used for uh, trucking fuel, feeding military personnel, humanitarian aid, uh, but even approaching some of what we call the core military functions of security and, as you probably know, from coverage of Abu Ghraib, even interrogation functions. Uh, now, with this increase in privatization comes a, a huge issue that Professor Dickinson has been researching uh, and her book will talk about when it comes out next year, which is how do we ensure that the public values upon which we try to promote through our uniform military personnel and are really um, vested as far as that task through the uniform military lawyer. How do we ensure that private military contractors, especially, uh, are able to bring those same values to the organizational structure as they are merged? Uh, this is something that Professor Dickinson, again, has been researching, studying. Uh, she and I were talking earlier this morning. She has talked to a wide variety of judge advocates, especially those deployed in the field, which is the best source uh, of information about what's going on. Uh, but can we, again, look at what's going on with regard to privatization, not just in the United States, but all over the world, uh, and, and not see some type of problems that need to be dealt with as she, as she has been researching? Let me tell you a little bit about her. She is a foundation professor of law at Arizona State University's Sandra Day O'Connor School of Law, where she directs the new Center of Transnational Public-Private Governance. She was a professor at the University of Connecticut School of Law from 2001 until 2008, uh, and also a visiting fellow and professor in the Law and Public Affairs program at Princeton in 2006 and 2007. She's a graduate of Harvard College, Yale Law School, and she served as a senior policy advisor to Harold Coe. Harold Coe is the dean of Yale Law School, but during the Clinton administration, uh, he was the assistant secretary of state for democracy, human rights, and labor. Uh, she has also served as a law clerk to Justices Stephen Breyer and Harry Blackman on the United States Supreme Court. She's written extensively, not just in the book that's forthcoming, about this issue of privatization and outsourcing of war and peace, 
Uh, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that her book, Outsourcing War and Peace, will be published next year, and we all look forward to reading that. But it's a great pleasure, Laura, to have you back at, at Duke. She was uh, here uh, some time ago for one of our conferences uh, that uh, Professor Schrader and I have been putting on for a number of years, and we're delighted to have you back. Laura, the podium is yours. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Ralph, for inviting me, and Scott, for that introduction. It's really great to be here. On September 16th of last year, security guards working for a company called Blackwater fired into a crowd in Baghdad's Misor Square, killing 17 people. Subsequent reports concluded that all of those killings were unjustified. Those guards were hired by the United States Department of State to guard diplomats in Iraq. This is just one of the many incidents that we've seen recently involving private military and security contractors in Iraq that have raised serious questions about abuse of force and other issues. And as this incident shows, we are outsourcing our foreign affairs to an extraordinary degree. Scott gave some figures on this. Now, in the 1980s, we outsourced a whole range of domestic governmental functions, health care, welfare, prison management, and so on. And we had quite a vibrant public debate about that. But in the early 1990s, this outsourcing and privatization trend hit the foreign policy agencies. And due to the ideology of privatization, combined with the uh, pressures to downsize and restructure the military at the end of the Cold War, we saw an enormous shift in the use of contractors to perform foreign affairs functions of government. But this shift happened without much of a public debate at the time. And so President Clinton uh, accelerated the use of contractors in Kosovo as part of a strategy to minimize uh, casualties of uniformed troops. But then the trend really took off during the current conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan under the Bush administration. And Scott gave the 180,000 figure, which I think is in my intro that I circulated. There's a new report that suggests it may now be 190,000. And we do have more contractors than troops in Iraq. And as Scott mentioned, they're doing a whole range of things from uh, you know, delivering food to troops, uh, cleaning latrines, maintaining weapons, to functions that require the use of force, such as guarding bases and diplomatic convoys, and in some cases, conducting interrogations. And so all of this outsourcing poses risks to what I call public law values. What do I mean by these values? Human dignity, the values that are embedded in international human rights law, the principle that the use of force is limited even in a time of armed conflict, values embedded in international humanitarian law, as well as the values that scholars Ben Kingsbury and Dick Stewart call the values of global administrative law, transparency, public participation, accountability. All of these are at risk. Now, the Blackwater incident isn't an isolated one. Another high-profile um, incident involves Triple Canopy, another security contractor who, uh, employee of this firm uh, working under contract with the Defense Department, went allegedly on a shooting spree just before he was scheduled to return home. According to fellow employees, he said, quote, I want to kill someone today, unquote and then proceeded to fire at several stopped cars and then reportedly laughed as he sped away. And it's also well known, as Scott pointed out, that um, contract interrogators and translators were implicated in the abuses at Abu Ghraib and in some cases reportedly supervised the troops uh, at Abu Ghraib. Some of the uh, military lawyers um, 
who I've interviewed have said that uh, there are in some places as many as two incidents a week involving security contractors who allegedly uh, have used excessive force. So again, threat to these public values is real. Now, I don't bring up these incidents uh, to suggest that they are necessarily typical. And I would say that the contractors who are serving in Iraq are risking their lives. More than 1,000 of them have died. Um, and uh, I'm not suggesting that all contractors are somehow egregious human rights abusers and committing massive war crimes. On the other hand, there is an accountability problem and an accountability gap. And the laws and institutions that we have for protecting public values have been designed with the idea in mind that act, the actors in question are governmental actors, empl government employees. And so those laws and institutions are not really equipped to cope with this vast shift. And so the book is an attempt to think about how we can re-envision these laws and institutions to better cope with this privatization trend. Now, the starting point for the book is probably somewhat controversial because while I think that the debate about whether to outsource these functions at all is an important one. You know, should we have private security contractors at all? Should Congress pass a law banning the use of, of private security contractors altogether? I think that's an important debate. But I think the reality on the ground is such that, particularly if we want to bring troops home from Iraq and given our presence around the world, I think we're likely to see the use of these contractors increase rather than decrease. And so the conversation that I want to have in this book, that I want this book to provoke, is, well, OK, if we have these contractors, how can we better protect the public law values uh, that we care about? And the book focuses on three areas, litigation, both civil and criminal, the use of government contracts, and what I call organizational culture. I see these as different mechanisms for protecting <coughs> public values and uh, inculcating those values within the individuals and organizations that are projecting our power overseas. And a common theme that runs through uh, the book and my argument about each of these mechanisms is that we need to look beyond the formal rules the formal laws that are on the books to what I would call law in action. The enforcement mechanisms, the organizations that actually do the enforcement. And we need to think about how can we redesign these institutions so that they can be more effective when we have a privatized force. And so, for example, in the arena of government contracts, how might we think about writing the contracts with terms to protect public values and improve our oversight mechanism to do so. But what I want to talk about today is this third piece of the book, the role of organizational culture. And what I'm going to do is to draw on some insights from organizational theory as well as a series of more than 20 interviews that I conducted with uniformed military lawyers in the JAG Corps who recently returned from Iraq and Afghanistan and who uh, interacted with contractors there. And to look at the role that these lawyers play as accountability agents within the military who protect public values. And then I want to look at the impact of privatization on that role. And finally, whether there may be ways of inculcating those public values uh, within private military and security firms or through expanding the role of JAGs over those firms. So first, I'm going to talk about organizational theory. Then I'm going to explore the military's efforts in these regards, and then finally, uh, look at how the rise of contractors intersects with this culture. Turning first to organizational theory. 
Organizational theory is a body of research that stands at the intersection of economics, sociology, anthropology, and the law. And it looks at how norms get internalized through structures within organizations like corporations, law firms, and public bureaucracies. And in particular, this theory looks at what makes compliance units successful. Drawing on the work of Oliver Williamson, Richard Scott, Ed Rubin, Serge Taylor, David Wilkins, and others, I think we can isolate several factors that have an impact on the effectiveness of accountability agents within organizations. So first, a factor that's important, how integrated are the accountability agents with the rest of the employees, the operational employees? Do they commingle? What kinds of connections do they have? Second, how firmly committed to the values in question are the accountability agents? Third, do the accountability agents have an independent hierarchy of their own? And fourth, do the accountability agents um, have the ability to impose sanctions? So let's turn now to the military's efforts in these regards. If we focus on the role of one set of accountability agents in the military, the JAG Corps, the uniformed lawyers, and the particular value that the use of force is limited even in a time of armed conflict, we can see that the lawyers do fit the model of a fairly strong accountability unit. Post-Vietnam, the military dramatically expanded its role for the JAG. They invented the field of operational law so that JAG lawyers would actually be in combat working alongside commanders, reporting to commanders, advising commanders in the field. So if we look at this first value of integration, this first factor of integration, down to the brigade level, there are uniformed lawyers that are giving advice to commanders on a, a really wide range of legal issues. Um, and as one lawyer put it, helping the commander to know whether it's a, quote, good shoot or a bad shoot, giving advice on targeting, um, troops in contact, and other issues that implicate this value of limits on the use of force. Now, the lawyers themselves have the sense that integration is key to their effectiveness. As one lawyer put it, quote, when there's a military decision-making process in place, the lawyer should be there so the staff and the commander can see you as a part of the team rather than as a weenie lawyer. It's really important that the lawyers, as they say, go door to door and are really integrated into uh, that unit that is advising the commander. And integration means more than just mingling with troops. It means signaling that the lawyer's goals are the same as the troops' goals and that they are soldiers first and foremost. So a lot of lawyers who had prior combat experience said that it really helped them to get credibility with their commanders. And many said they had to show that they were willing to put themselves in danger. As one lawyer said, if there was an issue involving troops in contact, if there was a developing situation, my job was to be there. Now, at the same time, this integration means that the lawyers are putting the uh, legal norms in very operational terms. And so lawyer after lawyer interviewed said that when they gave legal advice, um, particularly when they were concerned the commander might be stretching the law, they said they would frame that advice in, ter in terms of the success of the overall mission. So as one lawyer said, you can't be Dr. No. Even if there were legal problems, our job was to give an alternative course of action that would accomplish the goal without the legal concerns. This integration also applies in the training process. So the lawyers give both pre-deployment and in theater um, very scenario-specific training in the rules of engagement. 
that are built around the kinds of incidents that are likely to arise in that particular situation. Um, and as Hayes Parks uh, said in a, a public lecture, um, he's a senior military lawyer, this kind of judgment that the JAGs are trying to teach is highly situational because international humanitarian law has some fairly clear rules, but the devil is in the details. How do you apply those rules? It's highly situational judgment that they're trying to teach. And one example in Iraq is violence at checkpoints. So there was a problem um, during the conflict, um, and based on reports, it seemed that um, too many people coming, I Iraqis coming through the checkpoints were getting killed when it didn't quite seem justified. And uh, in part because there were a lot of drunk drivers coming through the checkpoints. And so there was a revision of the rules of engagement as they applied to the checkpoints to um, try to minimize uh, those casualties. And uh, the lawyers played a role in updating the scenario-specific training in theater on that point. OK. Turning to the second factor, how firm are the beliefs? I think I have a lot of quotations in the paper. I, I was really struck um, from my interviews how strongly held uh, the beliefs of these lawyers are. Um, as one lawyer said, the linchpin that holds us together at the end of the day is that the rule of law has to exist where citizens believe in equal protection, fairness, equity, and justice. We make sure it exists within the military and through leverage within our own organization to other companies we're trying to help from demonstration. Turning to the third factor, is there an independent hierarchy? Now, I want to refine a little bit what I said in the paper. I don't mean to imply that the JAGs are deciding whether or not to prosecute an individual. Um, but uh, that, that's the commander's decision. But the JAGs have a chain of reporting of their own that is independent, somewhat independent of the commander. So they work, the lawyers work for their commander. But if they feel that a commander is stretching the law, they can go directly up the lawyer chain of command and get what many of them called top cover, which is um, additional advice and support from a more senior lawyer uh, in the military who could help them out. Now, that, many of them said, cannot be abused. If you cry wolf, you can undermine your credibility, um, both with your commander who, to whom you report and also to uh, within the JAG Corps as well. Nonetheless, many of the lawyers um, spoke about this option and the importance of it. The ability uh, to um, meet out sanctions. Again, it's the commander who has that authority, but the lawyers, um, unlike lawyers in some organizations, um, can invoke the Uniform Code of Military Justice and its array of both criminal and administrative sanctions against troops who cross the line. Now, is this perfect? Is the system perfect? No. Um, lawyers that I interviewed talked about how they do, in some cases, struggle to get credibility with their commanders. And one lawyer said, you know, in close cases, I felt the commander listen, listen to us only 50% of the time. We've also seen failures at Haditha, where um, the lawyer um, fell down on his job to report abuse. As um, one of the lawyers I interviewed said, he went native, and his loyalty to the troops in question outweighed his loyalty to these broader values. Um, but many JAGs could give examples where there might be an incident where a commander was planning to take an action that would stretch the reach of the law. And after listening to the JAG, scaled back or changed a course of action. Um, we also see, if you look at um, prosecutions for misconduct by troops, that we do have a fair number of these prosecutions. Now, if you look at the detainee abuse area, there's a report that suggests that one third of the uniformed military personnel implicated in the cases were recommended for court-martial and most received criminal or administrative penalties. Now, this report was 
arguing that there should be more prosecutions. But if you compare that to what's happened with the contractors, we've got only one prosecution for many, many more cases of abuse. They document 20 in that report. That figure is, I think, vastly underreporting the number of cases in which contractors have been implicated in abuses. And finally, I would just say uh, that uh, the uniformed military has been a very strong force behind revising the rules regarding the treatment of detainees and uh, critiquing the military commission's process. And so there's a very strong culture there of respect for these public values. So when we turn to the role that contractors play and the impact on the JAG, what happens then? They are, at least until recently, virtually completely outside this organizational framework, the security contractors, interrogators, and others. They get minimal pre-deployment training, specifically in the rules regarding use of force and the use of deadly force. In fact, the report that Ambassador Kennedy wrote in the wake of the Blackwater incident concluded that the Blackwater contractors uh, got insufficient training on the use of deadly force. They don't get the updated training on the battlefield. They don't have lawyers whispering into their ears telling them whether it's a good shoot or a bad shoot, um, helping them to decide whether it's okay to use force. I should also note that military lawyers are very concerned about the role that contractors are playing. Many of them described, particularly the security contractors, as mercenaries. They're worried that they're eroding the rule of law culture in the military. They can't be disciplined. The worst penalty they can impose is to really throw them off a military base. And that they are potentially undermining the JAG's ability to discipline their own troops. So there are many apocryphal stories of uh, troops who were disciplined um, for misconduct and then got rehired and came back to Iraq as contractors. They also witnessed a lot of incidents of use, abuse of force. One uh, lawyer said he regularly saw contractors using firing warning shots to clear, to clear traffic, many, many cases where there would be reported abuse. And then, as one lawyer put it, we have to clean up the mess and deal with the victims and the families. And they're very worried that it's hurting the mission. And they're very worried that the troops are getting punished, but the contractors are not. So what are the solutions here? How can we protect public values in this privatized, arena. There are really two options, I would argue. One is to increase the role of government supervision by expanding the authority of the JAG. And the other is to try to instill public values within the firms themselves. And with respect to expanding the role of the JAG, we've seen some of that happen. So in Lindsey Graham's amendment to the 2007 Defense Appropriations Act, the military got an expanded authority under the Uniform Code of Military Justice to try contractors in military courts. That has been recently implemented by the military, and we have our first test case of a, an Iraqi citizen contractor who was um, punished through the military system so, and there's some constitutional issues we can talk about in the Q&A there, but that's one route. And we also have a rule that the DOD has promulgated that would give JAGs more responsibility for training security contractors. Another approach would be to, to give the contractor and the contract firms a greater set of organizational features to impose, essentially, through legislation or to see whether they would do it voluntarily, 
organizational features within the firms that might enhance commitment to public value. So we could require better training. We could require that the firms have ombudspersons um, that are in theater, that are responsible for doing updated in-theater training and um, receiving reports of misconduct and communicating those reports to the appropriate authorities. Um, we could also try to expand the role for some of the industry associations like the International Peace Operations Association and their efforts to professionalize some of the firms um, they try to ensure that their members adhere to codes of conduct. We could, we, could, we could require membership in IPOA before granting a contract or require IPOA um, to, to actually give more teeth to their professionalization requirements. I should note that you know, this is an industry association. Many people have said that the fact that its members have to adhere to a code of conduct is pretty toothless. And while I think it is fairly weak, it's not completely toothless because Blackwater, in fact, withdrew from its IPOA membership after the organization launched an internal investigation in the wake of the Blackwater shooting. In the end, I think that when we use organizational theory, we can see just how profoundly the outsourcing trend does affect public values. And it also points the way towards some solutions. So thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Any questions or comments? Could part of the problem be like just lack of competition if it's just, you know, black water and the, the three canopies or whatever, so there's not really much of an alternative to go to another contractor? Right. Could the market solve this problem? You know, it's interesting. I talked to, I've talked to some contract, contractors and lawyers at contract firms, not as many as uh, troops, but one of the problems with just relying on the market is that the bidding process is such that the contract goes to the lower, lowest bidder. And for the contractors who do have the greater training programs and some of the organizational features that I'm talking about, they're worried about losing out. And it's interesting because a number of the contractors are in favor of enhanced regulation. Um, they, the ones who are often regarded as being more human rights protecting, um, they want the regulation because they feel that the bidding process is hurting them um, and that a mandated requirement such as a certain amount of training or having an ombudsperson or vetting employees in a certain way would actually um, help them. Uh, yeah. If uh, JAG works for uniformed military personnel. Is it possible that we could simply transfer that system directly over to the contractors, give them JAG officers, and do the exact same thing that we do with uniformed personnel, except do it with contractors too? Well, what I think that's a really interesting point. What does that actually mean? Let's let's look at it. So. By expanding the scope of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the commanders and the JAGs working for them have greater authority to punish and prosecute contractors within the military system. So that gives them, in a sense, more authority of that kind. And uh, I think that while there are some serious constitutional concerns there, there's a trilogy of cases from um, the 50s and 60s uh, where the Supreme Court looked very, was very, very concerned about civilians being tried in military courts. But those cases are um, mostly about civilian dependence of contractors. So if you had a contractor who, whose function was closely assimilated to that of a military, uh, that of troops, 
arguably that's a different scenario. Also, that was before we had the um, expansion of the rights for, uh, of the accused within the military system, which have expanded since then. Uh, so there, I think there is an argument, though I would note that the case that we have with the Iraqi national, or actually his joint Iraqi and Canadian citizen uh, citizenship, um, who's been tried in the military system or has been punished in the military system, I think that's a bad test case because I think there's a stronger argument if it's a U.S. citizen. Um, but So that's one way of doing it. But that's not the full range of JAG oversight and supervision. That would involve training and advice in theater. And at that point, and I certainly have argued that we should expand the role of JAG training. I think that that is certainly a potential way to go. But giving that full range of advice, I think, might be hard. Because it would essentially be subsuming the contractors back within the military. Now, maybe that's what we should do, right? I mean, I certainly think the JAG should have a greater role. I even suggested it in a congressional hearing. Um, I really think they should have greater oversight. Um, I think at the same time, we should be imposing um, rules on the firms themselves to have internal reporting structures. Yeah, um, my question comes from your last answer. In yeah. fact, there must be a reason why we have the privatization. And part of it must be to take certain blame away, at least from the military, and make sure it goes somewhere else. Uh, and some of it may have to do with other ideas of uh, shifting responsibilities and accountabilities. So to the extent that you say you shift the public values and accountability over to the privatized sector, either through expanding um, JAG jurisdiction or through um, enriching other modes of uh, the law, are you not taking away any potential uh, advantages uh, that privatization might have had or interests that might have led to privatization and thereby not really solve uh, the problem that led to the privatization in the first place, or, uh, or rather reinstall the problem that led to privatization, whatever that exact problem was in the beginning. So this is a very important point. And one, so what, what's the cause of privatization? And if the cause is in part or primarily to avoid respect for certain legal principles and to, in fact to undermine values. If that's, it's, that's part of the reason for it, um, then I'm rephrasing this a little bit, but then wouldn't, wouldn't it be hard to actually adopt the measures that I'm suggesting if that's the motivation? And with respect to cost, um, wouldn't imposing these measures be costly? Now I think from doing my research, and my second chapter looks at the history of this, I think that a big factor is the uh, ideology of privatization, that uh, big government is, is, is a problem and that the private sector can do things more cheaply. I think that this other motive to avoid compliance with the law, um, that our international humanitarian law rules have forced the military to become overly legalistic, and that that's a problem in the war on terror. Um, I think we can see that as, a, as also as a mo motivation, although I don't have any kind of smoking gun evidence. But I, I do think that there are enough people within the Bush administration, um, within the contract industry, who want regulation. And my re research on the history suggests that this uh, privatization ideology is a strong motive, that I think that um, I think there is promise toward adopting some of these reforms. That is to say, I think that cutting back on government waste is, a is one of the strong motives for privatization. And so there's not an objection to injecting public values back in to the equation through greater regulation of the private sector. Now, 
The question is then when, if you do that, will the cost be so great as to not make it worth it? Are all the cost savings in flouting of international law and uh, weakening public values? I don't think we know the answer to that. The contractors themselves don't think that's true. Um, but I do think we're in a regulatory moment where we can impose these requirements and then we can see. Does that answer your question? Um, that does answer your question. It, it leaves the, the doubt that came in an earlier question. When we have a factual monopolist as a private contractor doing this job, we talk about privatization as uh, raising efficiency. But the reason it raises efficiency is usually that we have market structures or something like that. I don't know enough about Blackboard. It seems to me that actual market structures were not really at work. So the suspicion to say the only real interest in this type of privatization would be to shield off some of the um, public responsibility uh, strikes me as not uh, as not negative. At least. I don't. So I see the general yes. privatization debate. I just don't see really how it plays out in this. Well, what I would context. say is that there are. It's, I think, striking uh, how strong a push there is from regulation among different quarters. So I, I don't think that that motive to undermine respect for international law is, I, I don't think that's the only thing at play here, and that many of the firms themselves want to essentially have a uh, smaller group among whom to compete with um, that would be human rights regarding and law of war abiding. So they have a stake in that. It's not that they don't want competition. They want some competition. So they do have a stake in it. They want to distinguish themselves from the firms that are not doing that. So they want, they want a regulated market is what they want. Sorry. Uh Going back to this yeah. uh, and the efficiencies of privatization, are we actually saving money? Because we I don't know. know. Yeah, we really don't know. It's, so the Senate did pass a provision that creates a commission to study this. And this is a core question, right? Nobody knows. So here we are. It's, and this is why I, I say it's ideology, right? Because it's the belief that this will cut costs. And we don't know whether it actually does. And it's a spillover from the domestic debate. And so the Senate did. Um, uh, create this commission, and one of the things that's going to be studied is where the cost savings actually comes from, and I think that's critical. But at the same time, right, we can seek to impose requirements that protect these public values. I'm wondering what your opinion uh, would be if this were to be applied on more of a uh, supranational uh, level, like to sort of solve the UN's blue helmet problem, um, and in terms of uh, accountability, since they'd be you know, held accountable to a whole bunch of countries, if, if you think that would uh, you know, help resolve that. Yes, and there's an, uh, an initiative of the Swiss government, a joint initiative between the Swiss government and the uh, Red Cross, the International Red Cross, to try to get countries to agree to a set of principles which interpret existing humanitarian law that would be best practices for contracting. And I think this is a very important initiative. I've been involved in it. I think it has to happen at the same time that regulation happens at the domestic level. So I know the premise of your project is to assume that the outsourcing continues at the same rate and the same types of activities. And that's probably the right angle to pursue, because it doesn't seem as though this is going away anytime soon. That said, listening to your talk, it seems to me that the, the greatest tension between public law values and privatization occurs in just a subset of outsourcing activities, namely those activities where we're asking outfits like Blackwater to interact with the enemy or with civilians with arms in their hands. Just the sort of activity that the US military has spent decades learning how to train disciplined forces 
to approach those same problems. So is it at all feasible to think that a revision of the uh, current practices uh, might include restricting the activities that can be outsourced? Let outsourcing continue to the extent that public policy and efficiency seems to dictate with respect to uh, preparing food, supplying food, uh, uh, driving uh, vehicles, uh, perhaps even maintaining some uh, camp security. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but restrict, restrict to the military the activities that involve uh, active and potentially dangerous interaction with the enemy or with civilian populations with arms in their hands. So, you know, you make a very important point. The, the risks to the kinds of public values that I'm talking about are greatest where the contractors are authorized to use force, particularly with respect to security and interrogation. And so why not think about just eliminating security interrogation contractors? Um, it's hard to get a good uh, firm number on how many interrogators and uh, and security contractors we actually have in Iraq and Afghanistan. The DOD has a 10,000 figure, roughly 10,000. Um, it's not a complete tally because there have been huge challenges in actually counting the contractors. Other estimates suggest there may be as many as 30,000. Um, I would say two things. First, from a pragmatic point of view, I think it would be hard um, to do that and bring back troops from Iraq and engage in the kind of nation building that we heard only yesterday the military is increasingly going to be doing. I just think that would be challenging. Second, uh, the risks to public values don't come only from those who, are, who have the weapons. They come predominantly there, but if you look at the rape case involving the KBR employee who was allegedly raped by her fellow employees, um, there are a number of other abusive force incidents that can arise um, in a conflict setting that go beyond um, the, uh, those contractors who are authorized to use force. So. I have one more question. Uh, so you talk about public values that get lost in privatization, but the areas of private law that you sometimes invoke, contract tort, et cetera, also have their own sets of values and policies instilled in them. Um, so is there something specifically public about the values that you're looking for? Or is it not just the problem that privatization leads to immunizing certain actors from all kinds of values and accountabilities, whether they be public or, um, uh, or private? And combined with that, is the problem one of organization, as you invoked earlier, much more than actual, actually the lack of uh, values involved in a certain set of uh, rules and interests? Okay, well, let me see. The, the first part of the question, um, what makes these public values, is a really important one. Um, you know, I come to this as a scholar of public international law. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the values that I know from public international law, as well as the values from global administrative law, and looking at the impact of outsourcing on those values. But, um, and really, essentially, what I'm saying is that we can have public values even if we have privatized actors. And, but the fact is that the public values that I'm looking at got constructed from a regime that sees those values as protections that we need to have against governmental misconduct. So in a sense, the implication of what I'm doing, again, is that these values go beyond uh, uh, protecting us from the state. And so what I'm looking at as public values are protections against misconduct of this governmental private hybrid. I'm not going as far as to suggest that these values would apply um, when a purely private actor might commit a crime against another private actor in a conflict situation. So I'm looking at this hybrid 
as something that we need to protect ourselves against. But I think I have more work to do in thinking about what this actually means um, for the nature of these public, public values. Laura, well, allow me a couple of observations on what you've said. Um, one, I think we all need to remember that since 1973, we have been away from the draft, and I personally don't think we're ever going to come back into a draft. So the question of how do you reverse the course and put uniforms back in the feeding lines is going to be very difficult when you're dealing with, as we are right now, a difficult environment where it's tough to get enough people into the, into the uniform military as it is. Uh, but Part of the cause of this, which goes back, as, as Professor Dickinson has said, uh, way back in the Clinton in, uh, administration and before, is that when the Bush administration came in and Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld started his, uh, basically what's called the transformation program of the Department of Defense, which takes what's called the tooth to tail relationship. It's the, the war fighters, the trigger pullers, the soldiers who have the weapons are at the pointy end of the spear, and yet at the other end, you've got the support troops, those that feed, those that truck fuel. And Rumsfeld's concept was, well, let's contract out those support functions so we can move more and more uniforms up to the pointy end, trigger pullers. That's the concept. And that's really what has been happening during this administration. But there have been some changes in that I think it was 1999, Laura, where there was a, a policy directed by the Assistant Secretary of the Army that says that interrogation would be a purely military function, would never be contracted out. Now, I never saw the reversal, but obviously there was a comeback from that. Uh, now, Congress is very concerned about this as well. Congressman David Price, that some of you know is from this district here in North Carolina, uh, is greatly concerned about accountability for contractors and, and really has got a bill that's already passed the House that would expand criminal accountability way beyond the current Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act. So you have a lot of players worrying about this very issue. <laughs> Professor Dickinson is studying it, and this book, which comes out next year, I think will be used by a lot of policymakers to try to understand the problem so that then they can come up with the right tools to deal with it. But having said that, join me in thanking Professor Dickinson for speaking to us today. Thank you.